Our waiting is over. Tonight we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the Good Shepherd who forgives our sins, who will come again, the Son of Mary, the Son of David, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. Hear this reading which comes to us from Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. We light this candle with great joy and celebration. Are we ready? Are we ready to receive the best gift ever? Yes, we are. Let us pray. Dear God, we are here to celebrate the birth of your son. We shall worship, welcome, and make room for him in our lives. Amen. Oh, come, let us.
Beloved in Christ, in this Christmas tide, let it be our care and delight to hear again the message of the angels and in heart and mind to go unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, the Son of God as a babe lying in a manger. Let us read and mark in Holy Scripture the tale of the loving purposes of God from the first days of our disobedience unto the glorious redemption brought to us by this holy child. And let us make this place glad with our carols of praise. But first, let us pray for the needs of his whole world, for peace and goodwill over all the earth, for those who preserve the peace for us in dangerous places, far from home on this Christmas night, for their families and loved ones. And because this of all things would rejoice his heart, let us at this time remember in his name the poor and the unemployed, the hungry and the oppressed, the sick and those who mourn, the lonely and the unloved, the aged and the little children, and those who know not the Lord Jesus or who love him not or who by sin have grieved his heart of love. Keep them from bitterness or despair as they remember the birth of him who for our sake became poor, that we might possess the true riches and may the song of the angels find an echo in their hearts. Lastly, we remember before God those who have shared our Christmases in years gone by and who rejoice with us, but upon another shore and in a greater light, that multitude which no one can number whose hope was in the word made flesh, and with whom in the Lord Jesus we forevermore are one. These prayers and praises let us humbly offer up to the throne of heaven in the words which Christ himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The Almighty God bless us with his grace. Christ, give us the joys of everlasting life. And under the fellowship of the angels above, may the King of angels, Bring us all. Amen. Sweet little Jesus boy, they made you be born in a manger. Sweet little holy child, we did Didn't know you come to save us, Lord, to take our sin away. Our eyes was blind, we couldn't see.
seems like we can do right. Look how we treated you. Today's reading is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Napoli. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice, rejoice at the harvest. As warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning and will be fuel for the fire. For us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this.
In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come to you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God.
this holy night, Luke tells us of the simple, wondrous birth of our Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. He tells us, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. And this enrollment was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be enrolled, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his espoused wife being great with child. And so it was, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. <coughs> And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. But the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, and he is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the sayings which were told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been shown unto them. This is the word of the Lord.
sleeping in a bed of hay. And all around there's no other sound than the lullaby who fourth lesson is the journey of the Magi, which is sometime later. It comes from Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12, 934 is the page number if you're following along on the Pew Bible. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for well, this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. When Herod called the Magi secretly, or then he called the Magi secretly and found from them the exact time the star had appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report him to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over a place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route.
fifth lesson is taken from John's Gospel, the first 14 verses, which is called The Mystery of the Incarnation. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to every man was coming in to the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed, In his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Joy of day. 
It's been a tradition here at the chapel for many years to give almost a third of all our offerings to 30 different ministries to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, uh, give shelter to the homeless, care for the sick, and to spread the message of the gospel throughout the world. So I ask now for your offering generously so that we'll be able to meet all these needs this Christmas time. Let us make our offering to the Lord. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt his worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Christ was born, O night, O holy night, O night divine. Tonight is a special night for many, many reasons. Here at the chapel, we all know Barbara Jones is celebrating her 90th birthday today. Barbara, stand up, would you? <clears throat> Barbara is one of the reasons I'm here at the chapel. Her husband, Jimmy, was on the search committee that uh, brought me here in the year 2000, and I sat next to Barbara at dinner, and I thought, gee, if they're all like Barbara, I'm coming. <laughs> so we're still here, and Jimmy's nearer 
to the Lord than we are, but we will meet him again in heaven. Why make such a fuss about someone's birthday? Why make such a fuss about a baby born in Bethlehem uh, so long ago? If you lived in uh, Iraq or Saudi Arabia or Iran today or many other places, you wouldn't be able to celebrate Christmas. It's prescribed. They don't want to hear about the birth of Jesus. So why do we do it? Why do we just celebrate together this wonderful festival, all this terrific music? Well, it's because of those words that were read to us from the beginning of John's Gospel. In the beginning, which are the first words of the Bible from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, before all time began, before creation began, in the beginning, the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word, the expression of God, His communication and His creative Word because God said, and we were created. All of us here were created by the Word of God according to Genesis chapter 1. And the Word, says John, in a startling, startling analogy, he says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have beheld his glory. Glory as of the only one of a kind son from the Father. Glory which to the people of the book meant that glory that hovered over the tabernacle in the wilderness and over the temple in Jerusalem, signifying the presence of God, that the presence of God was made flesh. So that we celebrate that the Jesus that was born in Bethlehem did not become just a great teacher or just a prophet or a holy man authorized or sent by God because in Jesus Christ we see no less than God made manifest in human flesh. That all of the divine that could be concentrated in human form was embodied in Jesus. And so Jesus and his birth is in a totally different league from any other leader. He was the man who was God. And in that lies a paradox and yet it is in this paradox that lies at the heart of Christianity. Many writers over the centuries have tried to explain Jesus as a purely human figure. Not God in the flesh, but a great human being. The latest is Reza Aslan. You may have seen him on television. He's written a book this past year called Zalot. The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. Became a bestseller this year. He rejects the Gospels, of course. He relies on a reconstruction of who Jesus was and is. He claims that Jesus preached a revolution against the Roman Empire. He was a sort of a spiritual terrorist. But Jesus was not raising an army to fight Caesar. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. He had a different opponent in view. Jesus sought to cast out the kingdom of darkness and the domain of demons. His battle was not with Rome, but with Satan. Zealot is yet another modern reconstruction of Jesus. It reads more like a novel than a work of historical analysis which reflects, of course, Razor Aslan's present position as a professor of creative writing at a university. It gets great reviews on Amazon from those who reject the gospel accounts and wish to believe that this is a fascinating and meticulously researched biography of Jesus. But to the contrary, other scholars say that it is riddled with errors probable errors and exaggerations. So what are we to make of this Jesus whose birthday we celebrate? He's no mythical figure because historical sources attest to his life. 
He was fully human, but he was more. <coughs> what convinced his disciples that he was the prototype human God in the flesh? First of all, his influence. He's been universally recognized as the ideal for human life. No one has had such a profound influence like Jesus. Phillips Brooks, who wrote the Christmas Carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, Phillips Brooks of Trinity Church, Copley Square in, in Boston, also wrote a little vignette he entitled One Solitary Life, which describes this influence of Jesus. He wrote, he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in still another village where he worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was a wandering preacher. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves, and while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. And when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. How could that person have any influence? But Phillips Brooks goes on to say, 19 centuries have come and gone. Today he remains the central figure of the human race and the leader of humanity's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the governments that ever sat, all the political leaders that ever ruled put together have not affected the life of human beings on this planet so much as that one solitary life. But secondly, there is his teaching. His teaching was memorable. He taught that the kingdom of God had arrived with him. No one ever spoke like this man, said the soldiers who had been sent to arrest him. My teaching, said Jesus, is not mine, but his who sent me. If any man is willing to do his will, he will have no doubts about where the teaching comes from, whether I speak from God or whether I speak from myself. And third, there was the conduct of his life. There was no sin in him. Which of you can point to anything wrong that I have done, he said. I always do what is pleasing to my heavenly Father. Here was one who taught the highest standard and embodied them completely. He claimed to bring God into our midst, and his life lent credibility to his claim. Something very few can claim. And fourthly, there are his miracles. They were meant to minister to the whole person, not just to the mind or the spirit. They were meant to point to his message. There were signs of what he was teaching as he fed the hungry so he can feed our hungry souls, as he opened blind eyes so he can make all of us see the truth about life, as he raised the dead so he can show us that he can bring new life to the spiritually dead. My deeds done in my Father's name, he said, are my credentials. I and the Father are one. If I am not acting as my Father would, do not believe me. But if I am, accept the evidence of my deeds, even if you do not believe me. Fifthly, there was the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is the fulfiller of the ancient scriptures. He is the great I am, the Son of Man, the Lord who is the Good Shepherd, the Messiah, the Savior, Redeemer. Sixthly, there are his claims. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. C.S. Lewis, that great writer, Christian apologist, and English professor at Oxford and Cambridge wrote, the things Jesus says are different from what any other teacher has said. Others say, this is the truth about the universe. This is the way you ought to go. But Jesus said, I am the truth and the way 
and the life. He says, no one can reach absolute reality except through me. Lewis went on to say, I'm trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, they say, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must and cannot say. Because a man who was merely a man and said the same things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he was a madman or something worse. And lastly, there is his death and his resurrection. The Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many. It was this supreme act of self-sacrifice and sin-bearing that we celebrate in Holy Weekend at Easter that the disciples saw straight through to the heart of God. That God had come to them in Christ and God had saved them through his cross and he demonstrated its truth through his resurrection from the dead, bringing us the gift of eternal life. So when you look at Jesus, what do you see? His disciples write, we saw his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, God's holy, life-giving presence. And if you see his glory, you'll want to receive his, his grace, the gift of his life and his love. Because Jesus came to bring us the gifts at Christmas time, the gift of the glory of God to change us from one degree of glory to another so that our lives are touched by the divine and we receive the gift of new birth into the family of God. And as we read the Gospels and his interaction with people, they become more and more alive as we see him speaking directly to us. Read the Gospels. And in that you will find that he regenerates lives and he brings the experience of the fullness of life with him. So we come and worship him, God with us, God who gives us life. So let us open ourselves to what he wants to give us this Christmas time, his saving presence and his loving power. Let him dwell in you. Let us pray together. <coughs> Lord God, let the mystery and holiness of your great gift to us, which tonight we celebrate afresh, come upon us as strangely and gloriously as the shepherds in the fields near Bethlehem. Tonight, let us glimpse the joy of angels at the goodness of God. Let us know ourselves freed by this infant savior from all that we are ashamed of and would leave behind, the guilt of a life selfishly lived, the burden of spoiled relationship and the misery of failed effort. Lord God, we bring all these tonight to the poor stable and ask that in this holy darkness, our past may no more be seen, but our present and future be lit by that shining and generous love which shone round the angels as they sang of glory and which shines for all of us where Christ is born. Bless tonight, O oh Lord God, those for whom, amidst others' joy, this is a hard and bitter time of suffering and remembering. Those for whom your gift seems to offer so little comfort, deepen true care in our hearts for them, and for those whom this night has no holiness or glimpse of the wonder of your love. Thank you that your gift is to us all, and that you patiently await our acceptance. Bring us all, dear Father, at last to know it and to receive it. And we pray in solidarity 
with all those who are your people who seek to worship you this Christmas time and who are in difficult circumstances, in places where they may declare themselves to be Christians would be to receive a death sentence. And so we pray for those who are persecuted, those who are minorities. And we pray that we may not take for granted the opportunities we have to hear your word and to receive your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Almighty God who sent his Son to take our nature upon him. Bless you in this holy season. Scatter the darkness of sin and brighten your heart with the light of his holiness. And God who sent his angels to proclaim the glad news of the Savior's birth, fill you with joy and make you heralds of the gospel. May God have been the Word made flesh, join the heaven to earth and earth to heaven, give you his peace and favor. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Stand and sing, O come all you faithful.